This is Wilmington's Big Talker, and my name is Paul Vallone. I'd like to welcome you to Guns, Politics, and Freedom, where each week we give you the ammunition to better defend your gun rights. Now, in case you aren't familiar with me, I direct Grassroots North Carolina, also called GRNC, since 1994, our state's most effective gun rights organization. As its director, I uh, was involved in drafting and passing our original concealed handgun law, and since then, GRNC has gone on to engineer passage of concealed handgun reciprocity, our purchase permit bypass, uh, the Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground laws, uh, expansion of concealed carry into state and municipal parks, restaurants, public assemblies, edu- educational properties, and much more. Grassroots North Carolina is exactly what the name implies, a grassroots collection of people from all walks of life who share a common concern that our constitutionally guaranteed freedoms are being eroded. Check us out at grnc.org. That's grnc.org. Our guest today is Jeff Knox, director of the Firearms Coalition and son of the legendary Neil Knox. Now, I'm dating myself here, but back in the 1990s, when I became involved in the gun rights movement, Neil was an early friend and mentor. Although Neil died in 2005, some of you may still remember that together with Harlan Carter, Neil Knox was instrumental in turning the NRA into the political juggernaut it is today. And a juggernaut it is indeed. According to the NRA's Federal Form 990 in 2015, it grossed nearly $337 million and paid its executive director, Wayne LaPierre, a princely $5.1 million per year. Chris Cox, who does the job I believe that Niels Knox once did, rakes in a cool $1.5 million. No less than five of its officers get paid more than $600,000 per year, and that doesn't include the untold sums of money paid to a consulting firm we will discuss shortly. So if you are, like me, an NRA member, that's where a lot of your money is going. Now, Jeff tells me this is an excellent time for an interview because this is the 40th anniversary of the legendary Cincinnati Revolution at the uh, at an NRA annual meeting. And now, Neil would often tell me the war stories of the 1970s when, in the wake of the massive Gun Control Act of 1968, even total handgun bans were very much on the table. He told me the uh, many legislative successes they had and then described in great detail, how the NRA went off the rails, nearly going bankrupt, and why today it endorses anti-gun legislation and anti-gun politicians. To his dying day, Neil was determined to reform the NRA and bring it back to its former greatness. Now, in 1984, Neil forged his own organization, the Firearms Coalition, with the intent of helping grassroots groups like mine make a greater impact on the legislative process to better defend gun rights. Today, Neil's sons, Jeff and Chris Knox, continue his legacy. Jeff Knox is a second-generation political activist and director of the Firearms Coalition. He writes regularly for Shotgun News and Front Sight Magazines, Ammo Land Shooting Sports News, and elsewhere. So with that, I would like to welcome Jeff Knox. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Very good, sir. Now, if memory serves... Uh, your dad became executive director of the NRA uh, in its then-new Institute for Legislative Action. Was that in 1974? No, 1978. 78, okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, I have to take a step back beyond that because, as you mentioned, this is this is the 40th anniversary year of the revolt of Cincinnati. So that was 1977. And in 1976, uh, dad and some others had been writing about the problems that they saw at NRA. Um, dad was the editor and publisher at Wolf Publishing. They, they published rifle and handloader magazines and um, he and John Wooters and several other fellows were talking back and forth about what on earth was going on at the NRA and, and what were they trying to do. And they found out that the leadership of the NRA, the board of directors and the president, had decided 
under advice from a uh, an outside consulting firm, they had decided that they were going to sell their headquarters building in D.C., and they were going to move the entire operation out to um, Colorado. Colorado? Is that what you're telling me? They're really going to move what is now the main gun rights organization, the largest in the world, to Colorado? Actually, I think it was New Mexico. Oh, uh, better yet. Out to, to, to the rip-roaring town of Raton, New Mexico. <laughs> they, they were going to build a... Uh, an outdoor shooting center and college, they called it, that that they were going to focus all of their efforts, all of the NRA's resources, on hunting and target shooting. Oh, the sportsmen. And, yes, those are the people we can't get involved in the gun rights movement now in many, in many cases. Got it. Sometimes, right. And so, and, and we have this, this report that they paid a whole lot of money for from an outfit called Orem that uh, it's available online and, and, and you can find it, O-R-E-M report. Um, the, they were really getting completely away from politics, selling the building in, in D.C. and making the NRA basically the Sierra Club with guns. Um, and that was the objective. And there were a lot of members, and they weren't telling the members about this at all. Uh, it was it was completely secret, um, not necessarily secret, but not talked about at all. And, I sense a trend um, developing here because that continues to be the case today. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. And so um, – at the members' meeting, Dad and and Wooters and and Francis Winters and uh, uh, all of these guys that that really cared about the NRA, cared about gun rights, and felt that this was uh, an abdication of responsibility for at that time the largest shooting organization in the country with a membership of something in the neighborhood of a half million, if I remember right. Um, and so at the NRA annual meeting of members in Cincinnati, dad stood up on the floor and said, Mr. President, uh, I offer the following resolution or the following motion. And that started the ball rolling. And, uh, the meeting went late into the night. And uh, from all day into the night with the members who were there at that time, the members who gathered for a members meeting had the full power of the membership. They could do anything. So they could overturn the board of directors, essentially. They could overturn decisions of the board of directors. Mm -hmm. Um, and what they actually did was try and overturn the board of directors themselves. They tried to fire these guys. <laughs> they fired a lot of, uh, several people in staff. They, they, um, pulled. But what was back. the bottom, what was the bottom line? What actually transpired when all was said and done at that, uh, that great revolution? Well, the lawyers limited some of what they could do and said, no, you can't do that, and backed up what they had done. But uh, in the end, um, Harlan Carter was made the executive vice president, which is the CEO of the organization, Uh for a princely sum of, I think, about $80,000 Oh, he missed the $5.1 million, huh? Oh, a little early for his time. But then um, the... The other key components, the really key components, were that instead of uh, board of directors elections being completely controlled by the board of directors, which the nominating committee, if there were 25 seats available, the nominating committee would nominate. Jeff, we're going to have to pick this up in just a moment. Okay. Um, I do want to hear the rest of that, and we're going to come back after uh, after our break here. Um, You are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com, and I am Paul Valone, 
your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We're going to take a short break, after which we will return with Jeff Knox in our discussion of the strengths and flaws of the National Rifle Association. But I also need you to grab a pen and a piece of paper because I'm going to give have you make three phone calls for freedom and help us pass House Bill 746, which will give North Carolinians permitless concealed carry and a variety of other good things for gun rights supporters. We're having a big problem getting the Senate to move this bill, and time is running out, so please join us after the break for our next segment of Guns, Politics, and Freedom. Welcome back. My name is Paul Vallone. I'm the host of Guns, Politics, and Freedom on 106.7, Wilmington's Big Talker. Before we return to our guest, Jeff Knox of the Firearms Coalition, and our expose on the National Rifle Association, we need your help. My organization, Grassroots North Carolina, is working hard to pass House Bill 746. If passed, House Bill 746 will give North Carolinians permitless concealed carry, very close to constitutional carry, relieving you of the burdens of obtaining a governmental permission slip to defend yourself and your family. It will also keep the concealed handgun permit system intact for reciprocity with other states, and it will improve your ability to carry in more locations than ever. But the bill is stalled in the Senate, and time time is running out. They expect to adjourn as soon as a week from today. In fact, I was over at the General Assembly today working this bill, and I'm proud to say I just got thrown out of the president pro tem's office by a, 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 his chief of staff, uh, and apparently I was uh, too insistent that they actually move this bill. So it seems that maybe they don't want to hear from us. So maybe that means we need to be heard from. So what I want you to do is I want you to call three critical Senate leaders. Got a pen handy? Those leaders are Senator Phil Berger. His phone number is 919 733 5708. That's 919 733 5708. Then we have Senator Bill Rabin at 919 733 5963. Again, 919 733 5963. And finally, Senator Harry Brown at 919 715 3034. That's 919 715 3034. Deliver them a, a call right now and a voicemail if need be and tell them to stop stalling and move House Bill 746 on Monday and get this sucker passed uh, so that we don't have to harass them all next year because if they don't pass it this year, they won't want to move it next year, but it does in fact remain technically alive, allowing us to beat them, beat the daylights out of them, metaphorically speaking, of course, for the next year. Now, Let us return to our guest, Jeff Knox of the Firearms Coalition and son of the legendary Neil Knox, who helped make the NRA a political force to be reckoned with. Welcome back, Jeff. I believe you were talking about the Cincinnati Revolution and how the NRA was just about to move to the hinterlands of New Mexico and turn into a sportsman's organization back in 78 uh, when uh, your father and uh, some other folks turned that around. Go right ahead. Well, Paul... um as I was saying, the the outcome of the revolt at Cincinnati, um, of course, the main thing was that they they reversed all of the decisions about moving away and selling the building and and all of that. Um, what they also did was there are 75 members of the NRA board of directors, and one third of them are elected each year. So each year, the nominating committee of the board of directors would nominate 25 people to fill the 25 vacancies, um, and that's all that you could vote for. Uh, so hmm. it 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 was a, a sounds Russian very democratic. Style, yeah, Soviet style election that <laughs> that you you have 25 seats. Here's 25 candidates. No one else to vote for. So one of the main things was they created a petition process whereby the members could petition to have someone's name put on the ballot. And dad 
uh, actually wrote the, the petition bill and uh, set the number at 250 qualified signatures to get on the ballot. Um, and he did that because 250 is a fairly difficult number to reach, not but not an impossible number to reach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, other things that they did was uh, a system for allowing members to recall by petition that they would force a recall vote for officers and directors. Uh, they also gave the, a, a path for members via petition to um, uh, propose bylaw changes, amendments to the bylaws by petition. And these these but, uh, changes remain in effect to, to today, correct? Uh, to a degree. To a degree. Um, <laughs> well, I, I seem to remember. I seem to remember the uh, the elections in the late 1990s when uh, your father was running for board of direction directors and uh, and doing, I believe, a petition run at that point because he was uh, on the outs. And uh, I remember whole uh, page ads in the uh, American Rifleman magazine saying, "Do not vote for these people." That sound familiar? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. They they would use their power to to keep us from being elected, keep our guys from being elected to the board. But the NRA members just recently had a bylaw change election. And ah, in that and I want to talk about election, I want to talk about that a little bit more later. Yes, we're going to get to that right. one toward the toward the end of, the, and that's the latest effort. I'm sort of bringing people up to speed on where the NRA is and why they are as they are today. Well, my my point, Paul, is that Dad created Dad and his his cohorts at Cincinnati created these petition processes, and while it was at 250 signatures, that's moved up to uh, a sliding scale of 700, and a recall, which was set at 450 signatures, is now up at uh, 6,000 qualified signatures <laughs> 6, to, to get a, a recall or a bylaw, and that's just that's just that's part of the things that happened at Cincinnati that have most recently been undone. But, I see. Uh, Coming out of the Cincinnati reforms, Dad nominated Harlan Carter to be the executive vice president. Um, they changed the way the executive vice president would be uh, named and, and made it uh, that he was elected to a five-year term by the members at the members' meeting rather than by the board of directors. And uh, they changed the focus of NRA. One of the things, at that time, NRA was charging rent to the ILA. So their lobbying arm had to pay rent for their offices in the (laughs) NRA headquarters building out of money that they would fundraise via direct mail predominantly. Um, They had to pay for advertising space in the magazine. Uh, So it was it was crazy and uh, the revolt at Cincinnati changed that put in Harlan Carter, and Harlan Carter changed those policies, too. And so beginning in 1977, Mm -hmm. NRA started down a different path. Um, And and became, that was a critical period of time, too, because as I recall, um, that was about the time just before the the so-called cop killer bullet ban, the uh, uh, shortly thereafter, we had, I guess, handgun control had various handgun bans on the table, and these were, were... Actually, uh, viable considerations. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Jimmy Carter was the president, and uh, it was Jimmy Carter was the president. The Democrats controlled the House and had controlled the House for mm-hmm. the previous twenty-five, thirty years. And uh, Dad was on the phone constantly with Harlan, and finally, in uh, early nineteen seventy-eight. Harlan convinced Dad to come out to Washington, D.C. to be the interim director of NRA ILA okay. and, um, for, for three months. Okay. And Dad agreed to it, and he packed his suitcase, and he went and got on an airplane, and Mom looked at us kids and said, well, I guess we're moving to Washington. <laughs> and we said, 
wait a minute. No, you said he, he said three months. And, and she looked at us and she shook her head and she said, no, once he gets started out there, there's no stopping him. That's exactly and what I remember that, of your father. You know, like some of us who get things done in this movement, uh, he was a man of extremely strong will. <laughs> absolutely. And, and his, one of his big things was, uh, repairing the worst of the Gun Control Act of 1968. We had people going to jail for driving from their house to their brother-in-law's house and cutting through a little town that had a gun law that, that they would stop them because they had an NRA sticker in the window of their car. Deer hunters were being stopped cutting through a corner of New Jersey as they were going into New England to hunt because they had a, a... a uh, NRA sticker or something that indicated that they were a hunter mm-hmm. on their window. And so they would be pulled over to search for firearms and taken to jail. And people and don't realize a, they think about gun control as being just now, but it actually was, uh, was very, very active, you know, after the assassinations of the 1960s and whatnot, Jeff, we're going to have to take another break. Um, and we'll be back just a moment uh, in just a moment with the uh, continuation of our, uh, history of the NRA and where it, uh, how it got where it is right now. Uh, meantime, uh, you are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com, and I am Paul Valone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. After a moment, uh, and we'll take a short break, and after a moment we'll be back to return with Jeff Knox, director of the Firearms Coalition. One of his big things was uh, repairing the worst of the Gun Control Act of 1968. We had people going to jail yeah. for driving from their house to their brother-in-law's house and cutting through a little town that had a gun law that, that they would stop them because they had an NRA sticker in the window of their car. Deer hunters were being stopped cutting through a corner of New Jersey as they were going into New England to hunt because they had a, 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 a NRA sticker or something that indicated that they were a hunter mm-hmm. on their window. And so they would be pulled over to search for firearms and taken to jail. And people and don't realize a, they think about gun control as being just now, but it actually was uh, was very, very active you know, after the assassinations of the 1960s and whatnot. Jeff, we're going to have to take another break, um, and we'll be back just a moment, uh, in just a moment, with the uh, continuation of our uh, history of the NRA and where it, uh, how it got where it is right now. Uh, meantime, uh, you are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com, and I am Paul Valone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. After a moment, uh, and we'll take a short break, and after a moment, we'll be back to return with Jeff Knox, director of the Firearms Coalition. Welcome back. My name is Paul Valone, and I am the host of Guns, Politics, and Freedom on 106.7, Wilmington's Big Talker, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. In just a moment, we're going to return to our guest, Jeff Knox, director of the Firearms Coalition, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the National Rifle Association, what made it the juggernaut that it is today, and uh, some of the things are doing right, and some of the things are not doing exactly so right. So, uh, once again, uh, Jeff, uh, welcome back. And uh, I think we're going to talk about uh, how uh, Harlan Carter and Neil Knox and uh, uh, put together the Firearms Owner Protection Act and corrected some of those flaws you were talking about in the Gun Control Act of 1968. They were getting all sorts of people prosecuted for uh, crossing state lines. Welcome back, Jeff. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, people have to remember that up until 1968, 
you could go down to your local hardware store and buy a, a gun or ammunition. Or it order them by mail, as I recall. People were actually, there or were catalogs that uh, you could order uh, uh, surplus rifles from World War II or World War I and uh, just have them shipped to your door. Right, and you could get a, a decent rifle, you know, the the uh, uh, Manlickers and, and the Karkanovs and the... Uh, uh, Karkano, that's got kind of a of bad them. flavor to it Kar- now. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, and, of course, the Carcano being used to assassinate Kennedy was a mail-order gun out of the back of the NRA magazine um, mm. and was $12, I think, was what Oswald paid for it. So Always got to be somebody were, that screws the pooch, huh? Yeah, there were no – guns were not treated much differently than any other product that you could buy, a hammer or a shovel. And – after 1968, suddenly you you had to go through a, a licensed dealer who had to be licensed by the federal government. There was uh, paperwork done on buying ammunition. You couldn't ship components through the mail. Ammunition or components could not be purchased uh, through the mail. Um, it had to be face-to-face transactions, just like guns. And uh, it was transporting firearms. There was no exemption for you transporting a firearm, even if it was unloaded and disassembled and locked in separate cases. If you drove through a town that had a ban on on firearms, you could be arrested and convicted. Sounds and like the state of happen. New Jersey today. Absolutely. They're and, doing that now. So, with poor uh, people. I remember the case of uh, the woman uh, who accidentally drove from uh, Pennsylvania and in New Jersey with her licensed concealed handgun and uh, wound up in jail and facing considerable uh, penalties. Right. Shanine Allen, um, the, uh, those ty- types of cases, except in this case, I mean, in her case, it was in her purse accessible. And we're talking about deer hunters with their, their rifle disassembled and the ammunition separate unloaded in their trunk and being arrested. And a judge actually said that an NRA sticker on the window, a judge in New Jersey said that an NRA sticker on the window of the car was probable cause to pull the car over and search it for firearms. Wait, wait, wait. That was too early to be an Obama appointee. Just a second. How could that be? <laughs> oh, this is the Carter administration, remember? <laughs> yeah, pretty much um, the same thing, only uh, not quite as uh, organized. And one of the things that, that Carter wanted to do was go into the U.S. surplus. Now, they banned importation of, of uh, surplus military handguns completely, rifles almost completely. Uh, and they wanted to go in. Carter wanted to go in and chop up all of the remaining M1 Garands in the in the U.S. inventory. Mm. Um my. The Garands and the so, DARs and the M14s, he wanted to chop them all up. So let's talk about uh, uh, the Firearms Owners Protection Act, okay, that uh, that Neil helped craft. What exactly did that do uh, in, uh, in, you know, in short terms that people can understand? What did it do for gun owners and uh, keeping them from being prosecuted like that? Well, the main thing was it, it provided safe passage. If you were going from some place where your gun was legal to some place where your gun was legal and you had it stored in your vehicle in a way that was inaccessible, then you got safe passage. So today I could uh, drive, in theory, I could drive with safe passage if I locked that gun up in a trunk with the ammunition separately. I can drive through the state of New Jersey, in theory, without getting arrested. Is that right? Yes. As long as you don't stop for more than a moment, you can can do that. Okay. Uh, There was a guy who was, was... moving through New Jersey, and he stopped 20 miles short of the Pennsylvania line late at night and pulled into a parking lot and went to sleep and was arrested the next morning because he had stopped and stayed in New Jersey oh, with heavens. a quote-unquote assault rifle in oh, the back heavens. of his vehicle. Oh, and, and um, I know they're in this, the city of New York is pulling people off airplanes on, uh, on stops uh, when they have to change planes for another destination, too. Uh, there were some problems, though, with that Firearms Owners Protection Act. It eventually became law in 1986, I believe, and uh, right. there was a voice vote and some problems with that. What was the uh, what was the deal with that? Well, that was the Hughes Amendment, and uh, 
it, it was quite simply Hughes put forward an, an amendment to ban any future sales of machine guns, and uh, the, it it was passed supposedly on a voice vote. Charlie Rangel had the chair at the moment and uh, took the vote. You heard the you can see it on YouTube. Unfortunately, you can't guarantee that what you see and hear on YouTube is actual fact, and that's mm. that's the big problem. Mm. But it sounds very clear on the YouTube videos that I've seen that that the eyes did not have it. Uh, but Wrangle pushed forward. Someone uh, Charlie Wrangle for, is what he is. Yeah, someone called for a division of the house. He ignored that. They moved straight forward, and then did it. And what that means is that as of 1986, any machine gun that was already registered in 1986, you can sell and transfer with the $200 tax and the paperwork and all that right. nonsense. But anything that has been manufactured since 1986 cannot be registered and therefore it cannot be sold and transferred. And consequently, the with, this, with this dubious vote where they uh, they fail to follow procedure and call for division, uh, the, the, the call for division, uh, they have essentially made machine guns impossible to own because everything that was manufactured before 1986 has now been snapped up by collectors and guns that used to cost, you know, five hundred dollars are now selling for thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. Because you supply and demand. Now there is a very limited supply, which is yeah. going down. I had an, I had a uh, an early M sixteen uh, from a ratty gun from a police inventory that um, uh, I paid three thousand dollars for in the late nineteen nineties. I thought I was doing well to sell it for five thousand. It's probably worth twenty grand at this point, um, but uh, yeah, such any, is the nature. Any any registered M sixteen is a twenty thousand dollar gun today, um, and uh, the key thing here is that as they walk out of the chamber, and of course NRA could have called to kill the bill completely right then and there. Although it moved very quickly, NRA could have killed the bill, and they didn't. They didn't. Um, so this would be the, the first of the, and this was after Neil was already out of the NRA. We'll talk a little bit about that after right. the break. But uh, so this was the first of the NRA's little mistakes. Well, and and it could be argued both ways, you know, that, that well, they got the big bill that they wanted, although it was much watered down to the version that Dad had created. But um, they, uh, NRA... As, as he walked out of the chamber, Wayne LaPierre, who at that time was, was the executive director of NRA ILA, uh, said, this will not stand. This will be NRA's number one priority going forward <laughs> is going to be repeal of the Hughes Amendment. And, of course, we all know that NRA has never put forward any, any language that, that to, sounds to, to me. repeal the 86 band on my much smaller scale here in North Carolina. I remember that uh, Jeff Freeman representative for the NRA once told me when Mike Easley was still attorney general and still had an F from the uh, NRA, he said, we will never endorse Mike Easley. That would be shortly before Mike Easley ran for governor the first time. And then when he was, when he ran for reelection, he signed a bill for NRA commemorative license plates, earning the NRA some money. And guess what? His F went to an A plus with endorsement. Um, so, wow. yeah, that's uh, that's that's unfortunately uh, some of the things we've experienced here in North Carolina. And in upcoming segments, we will talk a little bit about what we've seen on, uh, I guess, the uh, A's for gun grabbers. And there was a, as I recall, no A's for gun grabbers movement. Uh, so right now you are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker, one hundred six point seven. WilmingtonBigTalker.com and I am Paul Valone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We're going to take a short break and then we'll return with Jeff Knox and our discussion of the NRA, but uh, we'll also talk about House Bill 746 because we need your help on that bill and getting it passed right now. Welcome back. My name is Paul Valone, and I'm the host of Guns, Politics, and Freedom on 106.7 
Wilmington's Big Talker. Before we return to our guest, Jeff Knox of the Firearms Coalition and our expose in the National Rifle Association, we need your help. We're trying to pass House Bill 746 to give North Carolinians permitless concealed carry and relieving them of many of the burdens of carrying concealed firearms for the protection of themselves and their family. But the bill is stalled in the Senate, and time is running out. So I need you to grab a pen and a piece of paper and write down some phone numbers. We need you to make three phone calls for freedom. Call these three critical North Carolina Senate leaders. Ready? The leaders are Senator Phil Berger at 919-733-5708. Then we have Senator Bill Rabin at 919-733-5963. And finally, Senator Harry Brown at 919-715-3034. Call them right now and tell them to stop stalling and move House Bill 746 to pass it before they adjourn. Now, back to Jeff Knox and... uh, Jeff, ultimately, I guess uh, Neil proved a little bit uh, too hardcore in defending gun rights for Harlan Carter and some of the folks at the NRA. What happened then? Well, uh, they got the, the uh, Firearms Owners Protection Act, uh, which Dad called the De-Control, Gun Decontrol Act. <laughs> um, they got that introduced by uh, Senator McClure and Congressman Harold Volkmer, and uh, pushed it for a couple of years. And in that time, of course, Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, and Dad continued his assault on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which he had had started, uh, which was a very big deal, got over $4 million taken out of their budget, which was a good chunk of change at Ouch. that time. There, yeah, that's a, that's a big bite. Right. And um, so, uh, but the problem was that now he was attacking an, a, a, an agency that was controlled by a Republican president rather than a Democrat president. And the Republicans started getting upset that dad was trying to make the Republicans keep their promises. Heaven and forbid so, we should actually hold the Republicans' feet to the fire. I've been uh, held, I guess, uh, called guilty of that more than once. And that's why I tell people my right. goal is to be reviled in all the right places. Right. So uh, Bob Dole, who was then a uh, Republican leader in the Senate, um, actually I think he was whip at the moment, uh, complained to Harlan Carter, and they went back and forth. And um, Dad, who was a rock star, an absolute rock star in the gun rights movement at the time, NRA had boomed with with their new focus on on fighting gun control the membership had uh, tripled uh, gone from a half million to to three million members and dad could walk into the floor of an NRA meeting and literally applause would break out spontaneously and standing yep. ovation. I believe it was, uh, what was it, Good Morning Gun Lobby? Was that what would get everybody up and on their feet? Absolutely. He would, <laughs> and this was, this was a dig because the NRA had always hated being called the gun lobby. Well, I hate being called the and, gun lobby, too. It's how they make us look like we're the disembodied merchants of death. Well, and Dad took that negative and turned it into a positive, and he <laughs> would say, you know, be proud to be yep. the gun lobby. Because Got it. It's, it's not this organization. It's you. It's you individually who are the gun lobby. And that really is what comes around. The bottom line was that Harlan uh, gave a lackey <laughs> dad's walking papers and had them meet dad at the front door, <sighs> took away his keys and his, and his credit cards, and handed him a box of junk out of his office and said, you're not allowed to come in. And Dad so had to it call began. My sister to come and pick him up from oh NRA headquarters that day. Uh, my, my, my. Now, we know that they've gone down the tubes a little bit in terms of their, their I guess, ideological purity since then. But um, one of the things that I recall your father was very concerned about in the late 90s and, and early 2000s was that despite that exponential growth in the NRA that you just described, 
um, that actually they might be going broke because a certain entity was siphoning so much money out of the NRA, which, of course, now makes it manifest itself in Wayne LaPierre's $5.1 million salary. So what was this group well, and what, what were they doing? The, and for clarity, Wayne's $5 million was a one-time thing, and, and the accountants write it off that it was a – a forced payout of a, a long-term uh, retirement. Well, even on the tax. even on his 2013 form 990, it was 1.1 million. So, um, right, it's and good good work if you can get thing. it. His 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 regular compensation is is right at a million dollars, um, and the he he took a big bump as did Woody, uh, the treasurer, a couple of years. Prior to that, okay, fair, um, fair, fair enough. He's not getting five million dollars every year. I'm, I'm very relieved to know that. But in any case, um, this, yeah, how did from, this, how did this group come to? Off of the NRA mm-hmm. board of directors, Wayne's salary went from two, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to eight hundred thousand dollars in just a few years, and and has been hovering right at that one million dollar mark for for several years. Okay, um, and. So at the record-breaking NRA membership meeting in in Atlanta this this year, with some eighty thousand NRA members in attendance at wow. the at the expo, uh, it would take all of those members' annual dues to pay for just three or four people sitting up on the dais that oh, day. I feel so, very sad uh, now. I'm so sad. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's but why the, I, I the joined real... as a life member, but I don't send them any more money right now. That's exactly right. right. And I think everybody should be a member of the NRA, and and I encourage going I, blind I membership. Agree. You can do it at the annual meeting and do it really cheap. The and bottom line is, for better or for worse, the strength vote. of the NRA is the strength of the NRA. The strength of the gun rights movement is judged by the strength of the NRA. So we, yes, we yeah, have to keep right. them strong. Absolutely, and. The, but one of the core problems that has always been at NRA is the top-down mentality that the NRA at headquarters makes all of the decisions and takes it down into the states, and they don't have good back channels coming back up to take the information from the grassroots groups and the guys on the ground in the states and apply that to their their policies Hallelujah. at headquarters. Way back during the when the NRA decided to do an endorsement of Jim Hunt, the guy who had uh, himself endorsed assault weapon bans, so-called assault weapon bans, uh, Tanya Matoxa came down to tell the natives what they ought to accept, and we wound up nose to nose at the Velvet Cloak Inn here in Raleigh, uh, with uh, Tanya going, uh, "Do you want a war? Is that what you want?" Uh, it, it got kind of ugly at that point because they wanted to tell us what to do about the uh, Hunt endorsement and everything else, rather than actually taking any input. Now, what about Ackerman McQueen? What's, what was that about? Harlem brought in an advertising agency back in uh, the early seven, or the mid-70s when Dad was there um, to change the image of NRA. And uh, he, he actually took – Dad wanted Dad wanted to push that I am the gun lobby and have regular Joe Citizen holding his hunting rifle, his target rifle, his home defense handgun – and say, I am the gun lobby. Mm-hmm. And Ackerman and McQueen actually took that, changed it to I am the NRA, and quickly transitioned from regular Joe gun owner to celebrity yep. gun owner. And it has been the standard uh, ad for NRA for But the Ackerman and McQueen also took significant money out of the NRA. Their, their fees are, are exorbitant, as I recall. And at this point, we have a situation at the NRA, I believe, and I, we were discussing this the other day, where on most organizations, the board of directors runs the officers. In this case, Ackerman and McQueen and the, and the officers run the board of directors, largely bringing in ceremonial people like Frank Brownell and the Hornadies and, and other people that have great notoriety and are great gun rights supporters, but not necessarily all that knowledgeable about gun rights. Well, and and I, I wouldn't call Brownell, and it's Pete Brownell, who is yeah. now the president of NRA, and, okay. and I love Pete, and, and bless his heart, I, I sure hope that he can survive in in this environment and can get some good things accomplished um, as, as the president. Um, but yeah, the the NRA board of directors is 
it's a stellar group. It really yeah. is. It's it, they are but not always knowledgeable people. about what's going on at the NRA. I'm afraid, Jeff. I, I think at this point we are running out of time, uh, so I'm going to have to wrap it up right now. I hope I can have you on for a future segment if you could. Uh, I hope so, Paul. And please uh, invite people to visit our our um, Facebook page. Just Facebook. Uh, Slash Firearms Coalition is the okay. best place to Firearms find right Coalition now. it is. You are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, and I am Paul Vallone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We will see you next week and uh, give you more ammunition on better defending your gun rights. In this environment and can get some good things accomplished um, as, as the president. Um, but yeah, the, the NRA board of directors is, it's a stellar group. It really yeah. is. It's, it, they are but not always people. knowledgeable about what's going on at the NRA. I'm afraid, Jeff, I, I think at this point we are running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to have to wrap it up right now. I hope I can have you on for a future segment if you could. Uh, I hope so, Paul, and please uh, invite people to visit our, our, um, Facebook page, just Facebook, uh, Slash Firearms Coalition is the okay. best place to find Firearms right Coalition now. it is. You are listening to Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, and I am Paul Vallone, your host for Guns, Politics, and Freedom. We will see you next week and uh, give you more ammunition on better defending your gun rights.